Oh man. My head. <laughs> oh. Uh, okay. Alright, we're back. Oh, my head just hurts after that. That is depressing. Alright, I had to restart the stream and delete the VOD because it just leaked some information that it wasn't supposed to leak. <sighs> Praise God! <laughs> Praise God! Uh, amazing. Amazing! Wow. Wow. Alright, so that's awful. So to quickly go over <laughs> Oh, can we review this again? So for those who are curious, so we'll, we'll just do a quick, a quick, quick rundown. Two-minute drill. What's the Colot's conjecture? All right, Colot's conjecture is defined by um, a sequence just such such as this. If the previous element is even, divide by two. If the previous element is odd, multiply by three and add one. As an example, thirty divide by 2, it's even, get 15. Multiply by 3 and add 1 is 46. Divide by 2 is 23. Multiply by 3 and add 1, 70. Divide by 2, back to 35, or down to 35. Up to 106, down to 53. Um, up to 160, down to 80, 40, 20, 10, 5. Up to 16, down to 8. Down to 4, down to 2, down to 1, and then 1 would go back to 4, and you'd have this cycle. So what you're looking to do is to um, your sequence starting from any number will eventually come down to one. That's what the, the Colatz conjecture is. They're suggesting that for all possible natural numbers, all, po all non-zero uh, you know, non number, positive numbers, um, this is the case, that you will eventually get back down to one. In this, using the sequence, approaching the sequence. Now, what I was thinking was that what if you were to invert this sequence and go backwards, starting from one to all the possible numbers you could get? And what I came up with was something I'd like to call the Colot's inverted relation rather than the uh, Colot's inverted function, because it's not really a function anymore because you get two return values in some cases. Uh, as an example, 10, you can. Um, Divide 20 by 2 to get to 10, or you can uh, multiply 3 and add 1 to get to 10. So there's two different ways you can get to 10, end up at 10. Whereas something that's something like 8, you can only end up um, getting there from 16, right? You only can only divide by 2 to get to 8. If you subtract 1, if you subtract 1 and divide by 3, um, 7 thirds would be you know, three times seven thirds plus one can give you eight, but that's not a, a natural number, which then gives us this this condition that um, this only occurs when you're dealing with elements in f in the four modulo six equivalence class, and everything else is uh, is only just two times x, and that's simply because this this is the only class that is both will guarantee that x minus one over three is an integer, and it's also an odd integer. So odd and exists is what's required. So then you can, can you can do this funky thing with a union of things where you take a set of numbers and you say, okay, apply this F inverse to every one of those numbers and take the union of that with the original set and you get something like this as like sort of, sort of the iteration from one, two, three becomes one, two, four, six as an example. Um, and then you can define G of N, Y as a recursive definition of applying f multiple times so you know you apply this f to some g of n minus 1 of y and that's g of n y and then you can say g of 1 of y is just f applied to uh, y once and you end up with nesting uh, you know uh, multiple f's um, applied to y and the result of y and then you can suggest take the limit as n approaches infinity of this and that ought to give you your inverted Colot's relation closure. Um, and the Colot's conjecture would then be equivalent to showing that uh, the natural numbers is a subset of this um, construct. And then for the rest of the time, let's let C prime be this, this limit as n approaches infinity of G of n uh, applied to Y. And so now we've got to try to prove this. 
uh, this is true that n, the natural numbers, are a subset of C prime. And then, you know, I kind of went on and on for a while about, um, you know, why 4 modulo 6 and um, also some other kind of, you get some, you get kind of a bunch of funky things that happen when you start to consider these sequences, these sort of inverted sequences. Um, and I kind of jabbered on about that and then I was able to show also that actually what we end up showing is that we only need to show that um, 4 modulo 6 is a subset of C prime and that'll imply the Colatz conjecture as well. Um, the reason for this is because you can draw a one-to-one -one onto mapping between all the odd numbers and all, uh, all the numbers in 1 modulo 2 and all the numbers in 4 modulo 6 and then you can actually apply um, f to every odd number, um, right? This you took the set of all odd numbers, and you knew that that was in the Colatz enclosure, then you can apply f one time to all those numbers to get all the even numbers, and that would give you c prime. So, so yeah, you can show that this is sufficient to get what you we want, and then this is subsequently this is sufficient and then those numbers have a kind of a bunch of funky things going on with them too um, where you can then divide by powers of two and that has a particularly interesting sequence um, of the powers of two and the resulting odd number underlying odd number required to show that this particular 4 modulo 6 value is in the Colat sequence so something interesting going on here but it's not quite enough to get something that, tangible, something that we can grasp. It's just kind of neat. And then I was finagling around here. All right. That's like the quick five-minute drill. What, what was I just doing? <laughs> now, what I've decided to do is I said, okay, look. If you, if you execute this, uh, this G of N um, of Y, right? Right, so I want to I want to write some code that actually computes this somewhat semi-efficiently. What you can do is, excuse me, is you can show you can maybe take some some statistics about this, some data. And say okay, um, what is the after a certain number of iterations, what is the largest contiguous um, subarray from one to m, right? So one to m inclusive. Um, that's contiguous. That that's inside the, the 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 closure with respect to n, right? So for a given n, there's some m, and that m is is the um, largest number from one to m inclusive that, that of, of values that is in the enclosure that we've computed so far. The uh, yeah, the partial closure. So what I think is, you know, I really okay, fine. Um, I gotta turn off these notifications, man. They just pop up on stream. It's like if it's something sensitive, it's gonna be just there for the whole world. Um, it's good. Th it's a good thing I don't have a particularly large audience. <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, it could be dangerous. So, so anyway, um, what we want to do is find out with respect to M if there's some obvious relationship between m and n and what we can I, we can probably show if we really want to run a, take a hack at this at this this problem if we can show that there is there's either there's 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 really three options or broken well, two options so one there is a clear relationship between m and n and then that's either bounded or unbounded if it's unbounded then the Colatz conjecture is true if it's bounded, the Colatz conjecture is false. We should be able to actually show that there is some integer that is not included in the Colatz conjecture, and then we can actually show that it's false by showing applying the Colatz conjecture uh, Colatz sequence to that value and get a cycle that doesn't end at one. That is uh, that's the hope. Um, so that's one the, the first two options. The second option is that there is a provably unclear relationship between M and N, and therefore it's actually unprovable the whether or not the Colatz conjecture is is true or not. You can then make it um, un undecidable. Um, 
yeah, if it's algorithmically undecidable whether or not there's a relationship between those M and N, then that implies that the Collatz conjecture is similarly undecidable, and you're done. All right, because you only have you only have three options for that for that relationship. It's either um, incalculable, calculable, you can't can't cannot determine the relationship, or it's a bounded series, or it's a um, or an unbounded series that you know the the summation of the um, uh, sort of increases of uh, with respect to m that occur as n increases. Now, I do think it is logarithmic. At, I do think it's probably bounded by a logarithmic factor, if if it's bounded at all. Um, but uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, we're looking for a constant. A, con a constant bound would mean that it's it's um, that would mean that it's a, a false conjecture if it's if it's an unbound if it's a not a con non constant bound or unbounded then it's not uh, then it's true it's actually a true conjecture so okay so let's keep going um, uh, Right. So, okay. Let's just investigate here. Let's just see what do we get. What do we get? Um, all right. So let's try ten. Cannot open file. And closure. Set and list. Uh, 33. Oh, yeah, that's because of this. Yeah, that's fine. We can just do set of one. This really doesn't doesn't make a difference. Uh, okay. What if we do one, two, three, or no, three, four, five, six, Seven. Oh no no no! It's too much. Twenty. Okay. So you know it grows relatively quick. Uh, it really does. Um, twenty-five. I think it grows exponentially. This thing. Yeah. Thirty. Oh wow. Yeah, it grows quite fast. So let's see if we can say, all right, um, let's do this. Let's print. So we're going to have a next enclosure union. We'll have an M. And we're going to say M. We'll say while M is in vowels, M plus equals one, and then M minus equals one. All right? And then return M. Compute the values contiguous. Update the contiguous values. All right, so update the largest number of contiguous values. And then we say uh, contig values. And this is going to be initially, I think, two. do is actually print um, at each step. I want to print uh, I and contig values. 
and we don't necessarily need to print print this. One, two, two, two. Maybe we'll just print at the end. We'll print uh, the result. Yeah, see, this is so much faster than C++. Man. <laughs> so much faster. We'll print to sort the result, too. So... One, two, three, four, five, six, nine, six, right? If we go to like 20, nine, 19, 24, right? This gets gigantic, this enclosure, but this doesn't grow very much, right? We have up to 24 and then boom, 25 is missing. And if we go to 30, this is huge, the number of numbers we've got. Look at how many numbers we got in there. But we're only up to 26. 29 gets you to 26. Look at, look at how long 26 is stuck there. 29, 26. 27 is just gone. It's missing. Um, let's suppose we don't print it anymore. And we say 40. Yeah, still 26, 50, 100, 100. Oh, it's really slowing down, man. Whew. Wow. Now, I'm not entirely sure why it slows down so much. I, I was actually thinking this is a relatively efficient approach. Um, I mean, I'm missing something. This looks like it grows very fast. Um, this is a set, right? Is this not a hash set? Maybe because it's recreating this each time. I know. Hmm. Uh. Huh. I don't know. Why is this going so slow? I was not expecting this to be so slow. So you could speed it up a bit by bit shifting this once. Hmm. I guess there's a lot of new values that get created each time. Oh, maybe that's why. Uh, I think that's probably why. That must be why this is so much so inefficient. I was thinking this was rather rather efficient, but it's actually extremely inefficient. And I don't know why. 
Oh, that grows very fast. Yeah, you see that? How many numbers there are? 823,000 of these new numbers each time. Whoa. And if we look at how many, just how many numbers there are in the first place. Wow. Okay, I see. So each of these iterations goes through a lot of numbers. It's exponential. Okay. Well, that sucks. <laughs> it's too many numbers for me to process. No. <laughs> that sucks, but that's kind of interesting. So this is actually wildly inefficient. Or it's just inefficient. It's It's not... It's not actually obscenely inefficient, it's just inefficient. Um, shucks, man. How far out do we have to go to get 27? Wow. This is maybe a little harder to prove than we realized. So 82, right, 41, one twenty four, sixty two, thirty one, ninety three, or ninety four. Forty seven, hundred and forty one plus one is two, seventy one, two hundred and fourteen. Hundred and seven, three hundred twenty two, uh, it's hundred and sixty six. No, hundred sixty one. Thank you. Four hundred eighty four. Holy smokes. Two hundred forty two. One hundred twenty one. Three hundred sixty four. This one goes all over the place. 182, 91, 274, 100, and uh, looks like this is 87. No. No, that's not 187. That's, uh, excuse me, uh, 1337. Yeah, that seems right.
206, 103, 310. Holy squacamole, man. Whew. 931. No, no, no. 155. No, yeah. Right, times 2. 155 times 3 plus 1. 466. 233. Seven hundred. Oh, it just keeps going, huh? <laughs> it just keeps going. Wow. Holy smokes, it just keeps going. When does it stop? Who knows? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> 395. Oh my goodness. Look at this thing. This is unreal. Wow. Wow. Jeez. Forty-five, right? Oh wow! Oh wow! Amazing. So this just goes kind of everywhere. I mean, this is a lot of numbers to work through. Holy smokes. Oh, it's a lot of numbers in between. <laughs> Maybe I should just compute this using a, uh, a script. Uh, compute callouts trail path. So we'll say while x is not equal to 1. Sanity check if x is less than 1, turn negative 1, uh, or just throw raise exception um, must. Okay, let's say if x modulo 2 equals 0, then x equals so ret is initially x, ret dot append, x divided by 2, and then
and then else pen three times x plus one three times x plus one turn red okay so Twenty seven. All right, how do we do here? This is a doozy. You don't get past twenty six. And uh, didn't take very much time. Didn't take very much time from the computer to figure this one out, but wow, that is, oh man. Hundred and twelve in between values. So I would have needed to calculate hundred and twelve things. hundred and twelve interim values here. Whoa. Now is that that does seem familiar because that's this one here. Sixteen hundred and twelve times. That would have gotten us 27. Yeah, 27 is nowhere. Well, 27 on here on this guy is. Um, 82. Oh. Oh, okay. So we need to get 41, which then we need to get. Oh, it gives us the whole list. 112 numbers in between. Amazing. 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 Now let's do this. Let's see how many odd numbers. Let's see, how do we do? How do we do? Odds. So these are all the odd numbers required, the largest of which is 3077. Okay, interesting. So we need to go all the way out to um, nine thousand two hundred thirty-two in order to uh, to get to twenty-seven here. Whoa, man! Whoa! 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 These are all these other odd numbers in order to get 27. Wow. Let's see. Okay. Uh, right.
Hmm. How many of this, how many of these call it res 2? How many of these things are, are we missing? So we have four x and odds. If x not in res 2 red How far off are we from this? None of them, really. Oh, no, that's why. That's wrong. Oh, it's a lot of missing values, man. Oh, jeez. Oof. Wow. Let's go to 50. Like how far away, how far away are we? 26. Twenty-three, twenty-one. Oh man, it looks like every five numbers we get two two numbers closer. So if we go, if we go like a hundred and ten. Oh jeez. Wow. This could take a very long time. I don't know if this will even terminate at any point. Yeah, it grows exponentially, this thing. Oh, that's a lot of numbers to consider. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, it seems like every time it's a constant fraction that you're adding, which makes this an exponential time algorithm. Seems to be about a fifth of these numbers are new numbers. Well, it's actually about a sixth, right? Uh, at about a sixth. It's, yeah, it's about it's all of the numbers that are four modulo six. Yeah. Approximates a sixth. So this is. I think we'll never hit one ten with this algorithm. Well, now we. I guess we learned. We learned that this is a super slow algorithm. Super slow algorithm. Wow. Shucks. Shucks. We could approach this in a different way, I think, to make this more efficient. And that goes back to this idea that we had about these um, these values down here or up here. This thing would be useful. <laughs> and also, um, this would be useful. 
so we can sort of figure out, you know, for a given path, each of the odd numbers, we can sort out wh which of these sequences that odd number belongs to, right? Because each of these sequences are, have, are, are exponential in terms of their, their growth. So we take a logarithmic time per element on that path to figure out which whether or not it belongs to the particular sequence. Um, and then it takes some time to figure out which, um, I guess it would be n log n time, I guess with respect to the number of val the val each value on that path and then the number of values on the path, I guess so was, yeah, how many of those values there are. In the case of 27, there was 112 different numbers in between, which is kind of a lot of numbers in between. So maybe, uh, hmm. Oh, this supposed to be a plus here. Um, right, this is starting to get slow. This solution, saving this rather. Yeah, this is going to be impossibly slow. This calculation. Uh, wow. Yeah, I'm thinking I have to I have to rethink this entirely. Well, it's a good thing I tested it. Yeah, it's extremely slow. It doesn't matter if it's C++ or Python. Um, we're going to want something like this. We're going to want to use... We're going to want to do for each value, calculate its path, and then all the values in that path. And then we can calculate um, how deep we need to go for that path, how deep into the enclosure, quote unquote, we need to go. Um, something like that. That would just give us more data. But yeah, this is not going to be good enough, actually. Uh, this just is just too expensive. I think the conjecture is false. Judging by how this algorithm, how slowly this algorithm is growing, um, that implies that the relationship between M and N is not, it's, yeah, it's exponential. Um, meaning you need to increase N exponentially in order to increase N a linear factor. Well, I shouldn't say that. I guess it looks like it looks like the relationship between n and m is maybe linear. Um, like there's only a few factors smaller than n here. That being said, the number of numbers that you're you're cranking out, churning out, is absurd. So maybe that's why this is such an interesting problem is that um, the way that it's set up, you end up working through this enclosure is a very large mass of numbers and so it's very difficult to see any patterns. Um, so it's difficult, difficult to actually prove anything. But uh, I actually do think this is true the more I look at it. Or think about it. I think you can. The num how deep you're going to have to go with respect to your enclosure. I think it. Yeah, I think it's. I think M and N are actually linearly proportional to each other. Granted, the enclosure is exponentially large as you increase M and N, but I think the relationship between the two is is linear, and it's going to be effectively impossible to even if you were to find a counterexample for the Colat sequence, it'll be a lot of computation. Well, no. 
finding that counterexample would take you an eternity if you were to compute it this way. But once you found it, it should be relatively efficient to uh, to show that it, it is a solid counterexample. But I think I think it's impossible. I do think it's impossible. I think it's correct. This conjecture. It's just uh, you know what makes it correct really. Yeah, look at this. This is, I'll leave this all night. See how far we get. I don't think we'll get to 27. Well, uh, I should take it back. I'm not sure that this is linear, right? It's it's about linear up to 23, and then after 23, it looks like it's almost exponential. Like it's about four times. 23 to get to 27. So maybe it is actually exponential. Still, if it's unbounded, it doesn't matter, right? Even if, even if it, the relationship is n is got to be exponentially larger than m, it still implies that we will get, we could eventually get, um, as long as that, that rate is still growing over time. Um, even if it's slowing down. I wonder if it's at all related to E. No, yeah, even the, log right, even the logarithmic factor is, uh, is still goes to infinity. Um, the logarithm of infinity is infinity. It's just extremely difficult to see that. So, yeah, I, su I suspect that's kind of what we're dealing with here. It's a variant of that notion. So hopefully, hopefully we can find a way. I th I think this is what we want ultimately. I think we want to use want to use and abuse these different um, these different sequences. I think this is the way to do it. There's some something a little little more clever that we can do that we have not yet used. All right, in that case, I'm going to leave this going overnight, and in the morning we'll see how we do. That is a, an exp exponential time algorithm. So, I mean, that was fun. That was kind of cool. We, we got to actually try out what I was thinking for a while, um, right? And programming that in C++ wouldn't, wouldn't have made a difference. But, yeah, man, there's all these, like, considerations in C++ that you don't need to even worry about in Python. It's, like, kind of awkward to go back from... Python back to C++. Because um, you can kind of just... There's a, there's a ton of minutia to consider when it comes to making your code more extensible and abstract and all that. Um, yeah. It's just a ton of stuff. Alright, anyway. Let me get going. So, yeah, thank you all for hanging out, saying hello. I do appreciate it. I will talk to you all soon. And, yeah, I think uh, this is neat. I'll just leave this. Just let it go for a while. See how far we get in the morning. See if we ever get to 27. I don't think we will. Look at these numbers, man. Still not at 20, Still not at 27. Still just 26. It's a gajillion numbers here. Yeah, I think a more effective way is to go one by one up up from, from 1 to M and compute how deep we need to go. Rather, instead of going from N to M, we can go from M to N, that in inverse function. I think that's better. Yeah, the other way around. And then we can figure out for each M how, how, how deep do we need to go for N. And then maybe we can find a way to prove that that has... Uh, that's unbounded. That either for every m, there's always some n that exists. Um, yeah, even if the n is gigantic, <laughs> it's kind of what we're, how we want to prove it. I think. I think that'll do it. But all right, let me let me go. Let me go. Take care. Take care.